linear uh, and accelerating achievement of prosperity uh, and of acceptance. And in general, there's a, a sort of widespread view, um, certainly uh, amongst um, uh, Jews and non-Jews alike in Britain, uh, that um, Jews have been generously treated, that the community is well integrated, uh, that um, the history of uh, Jews is one of um, sanctuary for refugees fleeing persecution as opposed to the rest of Europe, that Britain is very different than the rest of Europe uh, in its attitude towards Jews, that surely there have been incidents of uh, prejudice and uh, outbreaks of intolerance uh, over the years, but that by and large it's much closer to the American experience or the North American experience than it is uh, to the European experience. And there's certainly um, not a little truth in, in um, that view. Um, however, there are uh, also uh, good grounds for uh, challenging um, many of the optimistic assumptions that underlie this approach, in which Jews and the Jewish community have been uh, at least as instrumental as uh, uh, popular non-Jewish imagination in sustaining. Um, but let me uh, initially read a brief quote from the chief rabbi, our chief rabbi uh, of the United Synagogue in the uh, United Kingdom, which expresses this idea of Britain as a traditionally tolerant place for Jews, and it goes like this. This is a paragraph from an article that he published uh, in the Jewish and the Jewish Telegraph uh, as, as part of a celebration, a series of events celebrating uh, 350 years of reestablishment of Jewish presence in Britain. It goes like, here's a quote. The Jews who came here loved Britain. They owed it their freedom to live as Jews without fear. In many cases, they owed it their lives. Perhaps it takes an outsider fully to appreciate how remarkable Britain is. Jews loved its tolerance, its courtesy, its understated yet resolute commitment to liberty and civility. They loved Britain because it was British. It knew who and what it was, the leader of freedom in the modern world, the home of Shakespeare, Newton, the Industrial Revolution, and the mother of parliaments. It had confidence in itself, and because it did so, it did not feel threatened by newcomers. Without that confidence, bad things happen. So what you get here is an image of um, essentially a tolerant country uh, in which Jews have um, gradually but very uh, firmly reestablished their presence and uh, integrated themselves. Um, and um, what I want to suggest is, in fact, that uh, this is uh, effectively a misrepresentation of Jewish history uh, in Britain, uh, and that much of what's going on now needs to be understood in terms of um, a reevaluation of this history uh, in light of very well-known facts which have never been suppressed, but have been readily available and have been well-researched by mainstream historians, most of them Anglo-Jewish historians, and published in mainstream sources. Um, so, um, much of what one sees in, uh, in Britain in political discussions and in the mainstream press these days, um, independently of and connected with, however, to the boycott movement, is a um, obsession with Israel, uh, with the Middle East, uh, with uh, increasing entry uh, and filter, filtering into the mainstream of discourse uh, certain uh, images that we associate with traditional anti-Semitism, particularly the idea of an all-powerful Jewish conspiracy, which uh, manipulates the press. It's often described as the Zionist lobby, uh, sometimes as a Jewish lobby. It's regarded as resident uh, in, in America, but uh, with a, an effective branch uh, franchised in, in Britain. Uh, that this uh, group uh, essentially uh, manipulates foreign policy through uh, a variety of un unspecified mechanisms, uh, that it suppresses dissent, both in academia and uh, in public discussion. Now, this idea, which is a traditional idea on the fringes of the far left and far right, have always been there. These ideas are in North America. They've been part of the European anti-Semitic tradition for many years, certainly uh, formalized in the uh, protocols of the Elder Society, etc., have come to uh, permeate increasingly mainstream public discourse in Britain. And there's a tendency to, um, amongst commentators, particularly in uh, the Jewish community, to see this as a result of uh, the rise of uh, Islamism, uh, radical Islamic movements uh, in uh, the British uh, Islamic community, um, which by no means is uh, in, uh, entirely uh, um, controlled by these groups, but where these groups have become increasingly vocal. And to see uh, um, the left as, uh, or parts of the left, as a sort of impresarios for Islamism, which is the driving force, and therefore you get an idea of Britain as a kind of golden age, Britain, a myth of golden age in which Britain was traditionally tolerant of Jews and as well as other minorities. And uh, what happened is that the um, last 20 years, the last 10 to 15 years, has seen a kind of rise uh, 
or legitimization of this kind of um, vilification of Jews uh, by extension um, with the, or uh, to the uh, um, portrayal of uh, Israel as a criminal state, a rogue state, uh, and as therefore the operatives in a conspiracy, uh, a criminal conspiracy intended to advance its interests. Uh, and that all of this is very new and is foreign to um, traditional British discourse. Um, this, while sort of, uh, the, this, this kind of discourse, um, this extreme obsession with, uh, with Israel and, and almost a kind of mythic portrayal, Manichaean portrayal of um, the Middle East conflict as a portrayal of good versus evil, rather than a complex conflict between two competing national movements in which there's a great deal of justice on both sides, both the Palestinian and the Israeli side. There's a kind of um, denaturalization of this conflict, uh, and one can see it, um, this idea coming right through into the mainstream. That it exists on the fringes is nothing new, impressive, or frightening. It's always there as a kind of dormant um, virus uh, in, in, in the body politic of the West and in the Middle East. But that it is now infiltrated into the very center of public uh, discussion is what uh, ought to give cause for alarm. Let me give you a few examples of how uh, this plays out in Britain. I don't know to what extent you're aware of this sort of thing. So here are some examples which I think can be multiplied. I'm just going to select them uh, because they're particularly clear, but they're by no means unrepresentative of many things that do go on. By no means do all people believe these kinds of things, but that they go on in mainstream uh, political um, uh, circles is an indication of, of where things have headed. So Claire Short was a uh, minister in the late Tony Blair's Labour government, certainly a government that was not hostile to Israel by any means. Uh, and she served from 97 to 2003 as Minister of Development. Uh, she was on the left of the Labour Party, but by no means uh, one of the more extreme members. Uh, she posted a comment on a website called The Skies Are Weeping, which was set up to uh, promote a cantata written for Rachel Corey, who's the American peace activist killed by an Israeli army bulldozer in Gaza in 2003. And here's her statement. I'm written, written, and it's still there if you wish to see it. Uh, the article that I'm uh, using as the basis of this talk is posted on the YSL website so you can consult it uh, for these references. So here's Claire Short. I'm supporting the world premiere of a cantata for Rachel Corey because there's been an unusual campaign to silence even a cantata to commemorate a young woman who gave her life in order to stand for justice. I also believe that the U.S. backing for Israeli policies of expansion of the Israeli state and the question of the Palestinian people is the major cause of bitter division and violence in the world. Best wishes, Claire Short. So in a very succinct way, you have the idea, not that the conflict is brutal or that Israel is a misguided in its policies and targeted in legitimate points of view, uh, but the idea that, in fact, Israel and its policies combined with American encouragement is the source of all conflict in America, which is a very different sort of perspective. <coughs> Um, now, in 2006, the old the second example, uh, this is my government minister, a former government minister, uh, not some uh, wild-eyed radical uh, coming out leaflets at a university campus. So in 2006, uh, the all-parliamentary, um, all-party parliamentary inquiry on anti-Semitism released a report, a very important report. You can download it from the website. I, I contributed a, a paper as evidence to it. Uh, and the general gist of the report is that there's an alarming um, increase in anti-Semitic discourse as well as actual physical violence against Jews, where the discourse is actually more worrying than the violence. The uh, violence is still within the domain of incidents, whereas the discourse has become uh, uh, increasingly uh, widespread. Uh, and the uh, report, uh, the committee uh, chair was not Jewish, was a Labour parliamentarian by the name of Dennis and Shane, uh, and uh, there are others. Uh, the members of the committee were by and large not Jewish, and they expand all parties. Um, concluded that there was a serious problem uh, of racism directed to Jews uh, in, in Britain, a kind of renaissance of respectability for anti-Jewish discourse. The response in the press was extremely interesting amongst the academics. So um, most people, particularly on the left, this is who had traditionally greeted previous reports on other kinds of racism with great concern, particularly, for example, the McPherson report of uh, 97 on a racist murder of a, a um, black teenager, Stephen Lawrence, in 93, um, greeted such reports as evidence of the need for action, and quite rightly so, uh, dismissed this report as a diversionary attempt to take away attention uh, from the Palestinian problem and suppress dissent, and hence the operation of the Zionist lobby, 
uh, in Parliament. So this was the kind of thing. And these things were said openly um, on university uh, campuses by leading academics, as well as by commentators in the newspapers. And the quotes are given to you uh, in a paper. I won't go over them for because of the reasons of the time. Even more frightening um, than this, this in some sense has become uh, a daily uh, grind, these kinds of reactions, um, is the casual throwaway lines, which uh, public figures don't have strong high-profile involvement in the Middle East issue or Jewish issue, and are sort of benign figures on those questions, who will now often say things that betray an extraordinary um, willingness to take as default normative some of the very myths and tropes that we see as central to traditional anti-Semitic demonology. So Richard Dawkins, you may have heard of him, is well known as a um, professor of uh, genetics and scientific education. He wrote a book called The Selfish Gene, uh, which was an original, provocative, if not entirely uncontroversial view of uh, the way in which evolution works and translated into cultural terms. He's also a professor of public education and science at Oxford, uh, presents himself accurately, I think, as a uh, scientific humanist. He's also a militant atheist who spends most of his time arguing uh, these days that religion is, organized religion is the source of all suffering in human uh, history. Not a uh, terribly well documented uh, scholarly study, but that's neither here nor there. Published a book called The God Illusion, which was a bestseller both in Britain and America, and presents himself as a kind of forefront of uh, liberal uh, anti religious humanism. So he was recently interviewed on his attempt to set up a um, foundation for promoting uh, atheism uh, in America. He made the following statement in this interview in Guardian, which is the leading um, uh, left liberal newspaper in America. He said, um, when you think about how fantastically successful the Jewish lobby has been, though in fact they are less numerous, I'm told, he's talking about America, religious Jews anyway, than atheists, and yet they more or less monopolize American foreign policy, as far as many people can see. So if atheists could achieve a small fraction of that influence, the world would be a better place. What he's saying here is not intended to be incitement against Jews, simply, as we all know, uh, the Jews run foreign policy in America. Uh, there are a small number of people who, through, uh, he doesn't even use the term Zionist, the Jewish lobby, um, run American foreign policy, and if only we could achieve that power, this kind of a sympathetic envy of, of that sort of influence. So here you see uh, a malicious, uh, toxic, anti-Semitic myth being, being perpetuated as a normative assumption that needn't be discussed. It wasn't the main issue uh, in the review. More surprisingly, it aroused no uh, anger or indignation amongst the readers of the newspaper, but instead endorsement. This is the so-called left, um, except on the part of a few Jews who are treated as the usual suspects. Okay, so um, then we have the boycott movement, uh, which in Britain is actually quite unique. So um, interestingly enough, um, there are four major unions which have passed boycott motions. Uh, some, and in total, combined, they, they, they actually represent several hundred thousand workers. These are not small unions. One is Unison, which is the Union of Public Service uh, Workers. The other is the Transport General Workers Union. Uh, then there's the College and Universities Union, mine, which I've resigned from twice now, and maybe I have it because of the boycott issue. Uh, and um, then uh, there's the uh, Journalists Union. It's all past boycott motions of one description or another. Uh, and it's very interesting that none, no other country has this kind of phenomenon. So there are instances of boycott activity in uh, Europe, in North America, in Canada, QP, the Canadian Republic. Employees passed a boycott motion which was then very roundly condemned by uh, Buzz Hargrave, who's the dean of the American Canadian labor movement and the head of the United Auto Workers, which is a progressive left wing union, condemned it out of hand as an exercise in bigotry. So it, it has no traction, the boycott movement, even in Europe, where attitudes towards uh, Israel are far more hostile than they are explicitly on the surface than in Britain. But Britain seems to have this as a mainstream phenomenon. Um, now, the, the interesting um, now, it's interesting that uh, the uh, academic union, the Union of Colleges and Universities, recently uh, retreated from its boycott activities because they were advised that to pursue them by their own, they were advised by their legal team uh, to pursue the, the boycott activity would uh, run them the risk of uh, violating Britain's anti-racist uh, race, uh, discrimination laws. And the person who um, advised them on this uh, turns out uh, 
to be um, none other than Anthony Lester, who is a very distinguished uh, lawyer and journalist, sorry, lawyer and jurist, who was responsible for drafting much of Britain's uh, progressive anti-discrimination legislation from the 70s, the 1970s, comparable to the uh, landmark anti-discrimination uh, uh, laws that were passed in America in the 60s, uh, and which were used as a model, and explicitly used as a model. Now, uh, before his identity was revealed, as the author of this advice to discontinue the boycott activity, uh, when the uh, union first announced that uh, it was withdrawing from it, there was a tremendous uh, a protest from the boycott supporters within the union claiming that it was in fact Jewish lawyers and the Zionist conspiracy which had been responsible for this. They named one, Anthony Julius, who in fact had nothing to do with uh, this advice at all. Uh, and even after Anthony Lester was revealed as the source of the uh, advice, the letters kept pouring into the newspapers from leading academics, many of them, insisting that, in fact, this was an example of the suppression of dissent. Now, imagine if somebody had advised the union that it saw a course of action that was taking, ran the risk of uh, violating anti-discrimination laws because they were threatening to a course of action which exclude blacks or Muslims or any other ethnic minority, Catholics, whatever you wish. And the, there would have been massive embarrassment in the sense that they had crossed the line. But here, instead, what we had was a defense of the action and an attempt to um, stigmatize and marginalize uh, the legal advice, which was objective legal advice by one of the authors of progressive legislation that the left itself had applauded, and rightfully so, as a bulwark of defense against racism. And here, this so-called anti-racists were attacking the advice as nothing short of the suppression of dissent by the Zionist lobby, in those words. So we have a problem here. We have a serious problem. Now, it's even more interesting to look at um, uh, the issue of, of, of lobbies and dissent, okay, the suppression of dissent, because there have been at least, you know, I mean, a whole series of fairly high profile cases of suppression of dissent, or suppression of free expression of opinion, plus interference in. Uh, uh, internal affairs in Britain by lobbying groups, but none of them, interestingly enough, have been the so-called Zionist lobby. But they've also failed to attract any attention from the defenders of freedom who are making the noise here. So, for example, let me give you two, two, two particularly prominent examples. Uh, in um, December of 2006, it's not quite recent, the Attorney General of um, Britain uh, announced the cancellation of a major um, anti-corruption investigation by the Special Fraud Office of uh, uh, Saudi influence peddling uh, with the British um, aerospace industry uh, company, BAE, which is the largest manufacturer of uh, military equipment and particularly aircraft, military aircraft. Now, the, the um, event that they were investigating was a series of uh, kickbacks, alleged kickbacks, in which uh, British um, uh, Arms manufacturers were accused of paying large bribes to Saudi government officials in order to secure contracts. Now, this violates uh, Britain's, uh, aside from, um, from being bad uh, in itself, it violates Britain's treaty commitments uh, under the uh, international laws uh, which uh, Britain had signed to eliminate bribery and corruption from international trade. And the OECD sharply <coughs> criticized the decision of the government not to proceed, but to cancel uh, this investigation. The reason they cancelled it was given was for, uh, it threatened uh, British-Saudi uh, relations. But this was a clear example of a lobby, a very powerful economic lobby uh, and political lobby, uh, interfering in due process of law. In Britain, yet nobody, and it was widely covered in the British press. People expressed high sentiments, but there was never uh, upset over the issue of lobbying itself. It never became an issue. Now. Um, Here's another case, which is a direct parallel to some of the alleged um, suppressions, cases of suppression of dissent in the academic world, except that this one is well documented and actually took place. So in 2006, Cambridge University Press published a book called Alms for Jihad by two American academics, one called Millard Burr and the other called Robert uh, O'Collins, uh, both from the University of California. Uh, but it was published in Britain by Cambridge University Press, a very reputable um, university publisher. Now, the book actually alleged that certain, uh, certain Islamic charities, not all by any means, but certain, were traveling money through to terrorist groups, in particular to Al-Qaeda, Qaeda, 
Uh, in the spring of 2007, a, a wealthy Saudi businessman, Sheikh Khalid uh, bin Mahfouz, uh, brought a libel, who's also a banker, this banker, who has connections to the royal family, the Sultan of Saudi, brought a libel suit against the British courts and the CDP because his family was mentioned quite tangentially, incidentally, uh, in these books, uh, claiming the defamation of character. The result was that CUP didn't fight the case. Uh, the reason being the British libel laws notoriously favor uh, the plaintiff who brings a complaint. And it's almost impossible to win for a defendant. One of the rare cases where defendants won a libel case in Britain was where the uh, Deborah Lipstadt managed to have um, David Irving convicted, not convicted, out of his libel uh, case thrown out, and he, and he was saddled with the, law, uh, with the um, uh, legal cal costs which bankrupted him. Very few people realized what an enormous achievement this was in legal terms. Anyway, um, see, in order to avoid the cost of an expensive trial under Britain's skewed libel uh, 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 laws, CUP, the Cambridge University Press, settled out of court. How did they settle out of court? They pulped the copies of the books which they had uh, in uh, stock, <coughs> sent out letters to the libraries all over the world asking them to withdraw those that were in circulation. Only those in Britain were withdrawn. The Americans refused to withdraw their copy. Um, and uh, paid a large undisclosed amount of money. Now you might think this is a one uh, event, uh, uh, one one deal event. In fact, there have been numerous cases that uh, that um, Sheikh Khalid bin Mahfouz has brought against various writers in British courts because they expressed views that he disapproved of. But he's never been um, required to prove or to substantiate any of his claims of defamation of character because all of the uh, publishers who he has, or authors who he's brought claims against, have settled out of court for fear of being penalized by the British libel laws. Now, this would seem to me uh, naively uh, to be a fairly uh, clear cut case of suppression of dissent by powerful economic interests using uh, a misguided law. And one would think that uh, people who believe in freedom of speech, even if not necessarily agreeing with views expressed by those who use it, would jump on this as an example of a lobby. But in fact, the heroes of free speech in Britain refused to respond to this, and most of the press refused to report it. Uh, I found out about it through an article in the New York Times. Okay, so this is this is um, the kind of thing. Yet one sees on a daily basis um, the um, uh, charge of Zionist suppression of free speech. Well, if the Zionist lobby is suppressing free speech, they're not doing a very good job of it uh, because the nature of that speech is certainly not going their way, and Mearsharm and Walt, who have just finished a very successful um, uh, um, uh, several week engagement playing houses all over Britain, uh, every major campus, uh, were greeted as uh, conquering heroes. So that if there is a Zionist lobby, uh, they should be fired because they're totally incompetent. <laughs> now, the important point here is where does this idea of, this very traditional idea of Jewish power, exercised through mechanisms never made explicit, but always in the background is criminal conspiracy manipulating world events, the kind of stuff that fit Tsarist anti-Semitism, Nazi anti-Semitism, fascist uh, attitudes towards Jews that were traditionally associated with the, the right, but then became absorbed by Stalin um, and uh, mixed with uh, notions of Jews as, as uh, having their power through capitalism, uh, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Where does it enter the mainstream of a liberal democracy? Uh, in which moderation and respect for human rights have always been defining concern. <clears throat> well, um, we're told by people who look at this that in fact this is new in Britain, it's a new kind of anti-Semitism that has no roots in the past, and that if anything it's the result of the corruption of British society uh, by um, unfortunate uh, misguided political ideas, many of them attributed to Islamists. I think this is a serious mistake. Uh, Islamists uh, certainly exist in Britain and. Um, uh, aside from the issue of violence and terrorism, have uh, played a role in promoting extremist ideas. They certainly are a small minority from the Muslim community, uh, but they also have no power. They are, do not edit newspapers, mainstream British newspapers, they do not uh, control television stations, uh, they don't um, uh, run uh, academic uh, presses, and they do not uh, uh, generally have major positions at British universities. They are uh, a fringe group which has been uh, granted a fair amount of attention uh, and uh, misguided legitimization, but they are hardly, and they've also unfortunately persecuted uh, the Muslim community in large measure uh, and certainly progressive elements within it. But not only do uh, Islamists have very little power, Muslims in Britain as a community, there are several communities, do not have the kind of power 
required uh, to produce this kind of entry into mainstream consensus uh, that one sees. So this is, I think, a case of um, misguided deferral uh, or uh, misapplication of uh, the source of where this is coming from. Um, there, if, uh, if, in fact, it is coming from um, uh, a certain element of the left, um, it's not because the left is legitimizing Islamism as such, but because the anti-Semitic and racist elements of Islamism uh, resonate with the attitudes of that left as well as other elements. And you see this very clearly in that uh, other elements of Islamist propaganda, for example, uh, anti-gay attitudes, strong anti-Hindu and anti-Indian attitudes, uh, strong uh, anti-feminist views, uh, generally are not picked up and trumpeted but treated as a source of embarrassment. Uh, whereas uh, the, the anti-Semitism is generally treated as, as the perhaps misguided uh, but authentic voice of a liberation movement. So if anything, I think that these do reflect the attitudes of the homegrown population rather than of, uh, of uh, radical groups uh, operating on fringes of uh, immigrant communities. Um, in order to um, sort of substantiate that view, I think it's necessary to look, in this case briefly, I've given you a lot more detail on the papers and I'll go into it in the talk, some of the defining events of uh, Jewish life in Britain over the past 800 years, because actually something that, although the Jews are, have been in Britain uh, since the early Middle Ages, and are by no means foreign to Britain, but are integral to British society over a very long period of history, they're constantly treated as um, uh, immigrants, foreigners, and uh, indelibly uh, alien to British life. And I think that uh, is part of what uh, uh, is surfacing now, which is the attitude that uh, a very mainstream, deeply rooted set of cultural attitudes that run across the political spectrum, left, right, and center, according to which Jews as a collectivity are essentially illegitimate. And that their legitimacy consists primarily in their invisibility, that as individuals they can be granted um, entry into British society, gradually through induction into an elite, uh, but that their acceptability is conditional upon their suppression of the full dimensions of their Jewish identity and uh, uh, their uh, willingness to um, detach themselves and uh, ideally to uh, uh, reject any notion of uh, ethnic national dimension to their life. This might sound strange to an American audience uh, in which uh, multiculturalism uh, and, and ethnic diversity are built into the fabric of society, uh, but it is in fact an integral feature of Jewish life in Britain. Now, let me um, give you some um, sort of high points of, um, um, or sort of main points of reference to uh, uh, British Jewish history, which I think uh, will indicate the kind of um, factors that are at play, which we're seeing surface perhaps in packaging these days. Um, so, um, organized life in uh, Britain for Jews began with the Norman invasion in 1066, although there may well have been Jews prior to that. Uh, living in a country that is, Jews came along with the Norman invasion, um, and established themselves as a community uh, in the period of, of that invasion, which started in 1066. Um, in their first century in the country, they uh, established a community based in London, but in other parts of the country, they um, also created presence. They were largely uh, involved in financial activities, some commerce, but largely money lending, and this is due to the fact that they were coming from Ashkenazic lands, primarily France and Germany, where they uh, and continued to uh, be banned from other kinds of activities, they were banned from the craft guilds, from owning land, etc. in Britain as they were in these other countries. Now their role uh, as um, financial um, entrepreneurs, sources of capital, uh, gave them a special role. They, um, in fact, there was a special branch of the uh, treasury called the Jewish Exchequer, whose job it was to raise taxes from Jews. This money was used uh, for, uh, to finance uh, royal activities, military campaigns, and uh, building activities, and uh, they were subject to uh, um, special levies. And um, initially, they achieved a fair degree of prosperity. However, under uh, Henry VIII, uh, III, Henry III, um, they, uh, Henry III decided to impose upon them particularly heavy uh, levies called talages uh, to finance um, a whole set of both military campaigns and building projects, and they increased due to the uh, large debt. This resulted in the bankrupting of the community, which left it highly exposed uh, to uh, um, royal disinterest. So they enjoyed royal protection to the extent that they were a source of revenue. Um, on the other hand, they also were uh, 
and found themselves in a position of being extremely unpopular amongst the people to, from, to whom they were lending money. Uh, uh, and and uh, they were often given jobs of tax collection. This is an old medieval configuration, which we know well from a, a whole variety of um, European countries. Uh, so um, by the time um, they, <coughs> um, Edward I, who was responsible for the expulsion, came to um, the throne, um, they had lost their usefulness to, for, uh, under which they had joined, enjoyed royal protection for several hundred years, and uh, they were simply expelled en masse. Between that period, uh, there was a large, uh, Britain actually led the Western world uh, in Europe um, in the anti-Semitic violence. So the Jewish community was very small at the time of the expulsion. It was considered, it was estimated by at around 16,000, and that's considered high. They were definitely influential, also the population of Britain or England, where they lived, in England primarily, was not large. Um, so uh, the first recorded instance of a blood libel uh, in 1144, took place in, in, in Britain, where Jews were accused of ritual murder of William of Norwich during the Passover period. This charge gained momentum and climaxed um, uh, later in 1255 uh, with a, another blood libel trial. There was violence associated with each of these incidents. Then uh, the large scale violence that one sees uh, in, in the medieval period. Um, began with the coronation of Richard I, where Jews attempted to present gifts uh, at his coronation uh, in Westminster Abbey. They were prevented from entering the palace. Uh, the, uh, in fact, uh, their attempt to, to participate in the coronation, no doubt to secure a better position for themselves with the new monarch, resulted in uh, pogroms throughout London, which spread to York and various other communities. There was a famous pogrom in York in which several hundred people uh, 150 to be exact were killed. This was in 1190. And this then sparked off 100 years of rioting, uh, also um, um, measures of partial exclusions uh, from a variety of Jewish counties, sorry, a variety of British counties. Uh, and as a result, in 1290, by the time they were bankrupt, uh, they were simply thrown out in mass. So Britain was the first country to expel its Jews globally in a mass expulsion, 200 years before the Spanish expulsion. Uh, and, and uh, uh, over 200 years before the Spanish expulsion and the Portuguese expulsion. The interesting thing about this is that it's rarely discussed. Okay, so if you look at documentaries and pageants, the medieval uh, life in Britain is venerated as the time in which the major cultural institutions and political institutions of the country were established. And there's a great deal of fascination with the, the situation of Jews in, in Britain was never discussed. People know the facts, however, um, this kind of systematic persecution, and it extends farther than, than just the expulsion, part of the expulsion and part of the partial bans. They, Britain was the first country to force Jews to wear special clothing, yellow badges, uh, this kind of thing. But this kind of role is simply edited and airbrushed right out of the presentation of the Middle Ages. You'll read about Edward I, you won't read about the expulsion. You read about Henry III, you won't read about the colleges, and on and on and on. By contrast, everybody in Britain knows about uh, the Spanish Inquisition and the expulsion from Spain in 1492, and this is treated as a European catastrophe, not less than a Jewish catastrophe, so the sense that they did it. Whereas their own role is, is simply not acknowledged, even though the facts are entirely accessible. There's no, they've never been suppressed, and they were well researched, amongst others by Jewish historians of the classic variety like Cecil Roth. <coughs> okay, now, um, officially Jews then were banned for 400 years, and there was actual legislation preventing them from entering the country. However, there, was, there were communities throughout this 400-year uh, period of Jews living as Moranos, that is crypto-Jews, or they're called uh, um, new Christians who had protected themselves fleeing the Inquisition by, uh, by hiding behind uh, forced baptisms. And they lived there and established themselves um, as a reasonably successful uh, commercial communities with uh, trading uh, connections, and, and they were based in London, particularly in the 16th and uh, 17th century. However, what's not known is that they lived in a very precarious situation that should they be discovered, uh, they would be thrown out of the country. Uh, the extent to which the, uh, that this is the case has shown that there was a second expulsion not generally known about in 1609, when there was a fight within the Portuguese Morano community in London, and one group denounced the other as Jews, to further their business interests in the entire Portuguese community was thrown out. So it was a second, it was actually a second expulsion as late as 1609. Um, it was exactly in this period, incidentally, um, actually 
20 years before, that Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice and Jew of Malta were written. Okay, so these are generally, when, you, when, when discussed in the context of literary anti-Semitism, the sort of established uh, wisdom of uh, the luminaries from Oxford, Cambridge, and other places, is to assure us that this was just not really intended to be anti-Semitism. These were the cultural attitudes of Europe. But in fact, these attitudes were alive and well in the popular imagination of um, Renaissance Britain. Uh, and one sees that they had actual uh, serious uh, implications for public policy in this expulsion in 1609. They were not abstract ideas in popular imagination, reflected public policy. Um, now, we come to the Cromwell period. So in, in general, the, I don't know how much you know about the Cromwell readmission, which was celebrated in 2006, but the popular view, which was on one display last year, um, which the Jews trumpeted along with everyone else, was that Cromwell actually readmitted the Jews by, as a result of a petition from um, a Dutch Sephardi rabbi by the name of Rabbi Manasseh ben Israel, who in 1655 requested that the exclusion of Jews be reversed. There had been the Puritan Revolution. This had resulted in a radical form of Protestantism uh, with strong uh, attachment to the New Testament and Hebraism, and it was thought, well, now's a good time to bring them back. Uh, there's more positive attitudes, and then Cromwell graciously invited Jews back, and from then on it's been a slow but steady uh, progress up an inclined plane towards uh, integration, and that's when modern Jewish history started. In fact, this is largely mythic. Uh, there was never an invitation uh, or acceptance of uh, a request for Jews to return. It's true, in 1655, Rabbi Menashe ben Israel came to London with a pamphlet outlining his proposal for the return of the Jews. Um, uh, there are a number of reasons why he did this. I won't go into them now. Um, Cromwell, in fact, was interested in, 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 in facilitating this petition, the reason being that uh, the, the economy was not in good shape. Uh, the Jewish community in uh, Amsterdam was filling up, was more or less full up with Spanish and Portuguese refugees from the Inquisition, who were living up in as Jews. Uh, Holland, Amsterdam in particular, was the most liberal center in Europe. Jews could live openly. Uh, these people enjoyed international trading connections with the Orient and the Middle East because a lot of the Sephardic Jews had gone to the Balkans, and this was a golden opportunity for Britain to displace uh, uh, Amsterdam as a center for a variety of uh, trade and, and commercial activities. Cromwell presented um, the proposal to the Council of State, which was ruling the Parliament, and they wouldn't pass it. The reason they wouldn't pass it is there was a lot of opposition of two kinds, traditional religious opposition, including Protestants, and economic opposition from uh, merchants and traders in London who didn't want the competition. So in fact, the Council of State never approved uh, the readmission of Jews. So how did they get back? Well, actually, after the expulsion in 1609, the Jews drifted back uh, as Moranos in 16, uh, throughout the 17th century. By 1655, there was a substantial Spanish-Portuguese uh, Morano community in uh, London. Now, uh, in 1655, uh, Spain was at war with uh, um, Britain, and uh, the, the, the Spanish community was exposed not as Jews, but as Spaniards, suspected of possible collaboration with the Spanish crown. And, um, the result was that, again, due to a business dispute, one of the prominent uh, leaders of the Portuguese uh, Morano community, Dr. Nero Robles, uh, was denounced. Antonio Rodriguez Robles, who was a Morano merchant, denounced by one of his business rivals. Uh, as a Spanish agent, and all his property was confiscated. And his defense was very original. He said, you've got it wrong. I'm not Spanish. I'm a Portuguese Jew. Throwing the Inquisition, please give me back my property. Uh, and in fact, uh, his property was returned to him uh, by the Council of State uh, because it was decided that a Portuguese Jew was less threatening than a Spanish agent. This provided a legal precedent for Jews to live openly. And a section of the Milan community emerged out of the closet and established the first legal a synagogue in Creek Church Lane in London, and this was the reestablishment of the Jewish community as a matter of individual precedent. This was a precedent purely based on that individual case, and there's much else in Britain that had no uh, wider constitutional significance. However, it was used by the Jews to build up their position. Now, as soon as um, Cromwell um, died, and his son took over, and, and certainly when Charles II came back in the Restoration, there was a large reaction. Uh, against Jewish presence, uh, so that in fact they um, attempted to block further immigration because small numbers of Jews were then coming from Amsterdam to take advantage of the newly legalized uh, presence of the Jewish community. Charles II, fortunately, being a pragmatist and a bon vivant, had no interest in this. 
uh, and simply discarded their petitions. And again, in traditional uh, British fashion, it was essentially a right established uh, by um, uh, precedent rather than by legislation. The attempt to get legislation to uh, legalize the Jewish presence had failed, but they were allowed to build up a community uh, in small, uh, inconspicuous fashion through precedent. Uh, now, throughout the 17th uh, and early 18th century, the community developed and prospered uh, as, and, and uh, enjoyed a certain degree, a fair amount of peace uh, and, and success, uh, operating within the limits of uh, low profile, uh, uh, minimal visibility. However, again, we see in any, that uh, when attempts were made to uh, withdraw some of the uh, fairly strict legal constraints on Jewish integration into the economic and political life of the country, uh, the uh, traditional uh, anti-Jewish prejudice very quickly surfaced into uh, pretty virulent opposition and near violence. So again, it's not generally known, the Jewish Naturalization Bill of um, 1753. So Jews alien, who were not born in Britain were considered aliens like other people, uh, whereas non-Jews who were aliens could become naturalized in the same way people here can become naturalized. Jews did not, because the naturalization process required baptism. Now, um, some Jews, of course, converted to get around this, but those who didn't have, could go through a very expensive process called indemnization, which brought you partial rights, but not full rights, couldn't inherit property, and it wasn't clear that you could own land. So a bill was introduced uh, to, uh, uh, by a number of people for a variety of reasons to cancel this and to allow for Jewish naturalizations. The official title was called the Jewish Naturalization Bill. It became known historically as the Jew Bill of 1753. It passed both houses of parliament with war. <coughs> this touched off a massive counter-reaction of violent opposition in which the press uh, and uh, political circles and the church, uh, various religious groups, uh, campaigned against the bill, arguing that it indicated um, uh, a weakness in British public policy that the country was now open to domination by foreign Jewish conspiracies and economic interests. The result was that the opposition, which was explicitly racist, was so vociferous that the bill was withdrawn and repealed in 1753. Okay, this was a, a kind of pattern that we see repeating itself uh, um, time and time again. So there were pogroms in Poland and Ukraine in 1768, right, in the period of uh, post really serious pogroms. Uh, and this brought out uh, one of the first large influxes of East European Jewelry to um, uh, to um, um, uh, Britain. Uh, and interestingly enough, the, because it was an impoverished uh, community, immigration came between 1771 and 1774, they were an embarrassment to the Jewish community. There was crime, social problems, etc. As well as uh, a problem for the London authorities. And one sees the beginning of restrictions on Jewish immigration uh, with the mayor of London, for example. Uh, um, uh, the Lord Mayor of London um, offering uh, free passage to Jewish immigrants who are willing to return, okay. uh, go back to Poland and, and the Ukraine. Uh, and the um, uh, response of the Jewish community was to endorse this policy because uh, this immigration is considered uh, an embarrassment. Um, so what you see then is a general pattern of um, Jewish presence being tolerated by uh, precedent, attempts to uh, expand the domain of Jewish rights by uh, official legal procedures encountering a lot of opposition, and a Jewish community that uh, enjoys extremely limited conditional acceptance and living in constant fear of being, um, uh, of being uh, expelled or, or uh, subjected to, to a disadvantage, and often then uh, in the interest of protecting their uh, limited presence, uh, choosing to collaborate or at least cooperate with uh, government policies uh, which were restricted on things like immigration or Jewish laws, uh, Jewish, uh, Jewish rights. Uh, a similar kind of thing can be seen in the uh, campaign for Jewish uh, emancipation, if you can call it a campaign. So until um, there's a kind of myth that in 1858 Jews achieved political emancipation by an act of parliament, and it's not true. Uh, in, um, what happened was that until 1858 Jews could not sit in either house of parliament because, uh, as Jews, because they were, uh, the condition for membership uh, in the House of Commons was a member of Commons had to take Christian oath. Uh, and if they weren't prepared to do it, they didn't get their seats. They could be elected, but they wouldn't be seated. Uh, now, there were, between, uh, there were, between um, 
1830 and 1857, there were 13 bills that were proposed uh, for uh, called Jewish disability bills, which were intended to lift these restrictions. And all of them were blocked, uh, two in the House of uh, Commons and the rest in the House of Lords. They were consistently uh, turned back. And eventually, um, the way in which uh, Jews were allowed to enter the House of Commons uh, was that uh, Lionel Rothschild, who had been elected three times on three separate occasions and not allowed to take his seat because he wouldn't take his oath, um, finally was permitted uh, in, in 1858 uh, by an arrangement that Disraeli made with the House of Lords in the face of considerable opposition, which allowed each house to determine their own conditions of membership. And uh, as a result of this, the House of Commons then permitted Rothschild to determine his own oath and he was seated after uh, 11 years of attempting uh, to, to uh, take his seat. So there was no period of emancipation. Uh, now, um, in 18, that was, a, again, a case of an individual precedent that expired when the parliament that he sat in expired. Uh, in fact, what happened was then later, um, um, you, a bill was passed to, to regularize this arrangement uh, and eventually, it wasn't until uh, 1866 that Jews were then allowed uh, into both houses of parliament. But again, you see the pattern of an individual precedent being set and used to expand uh, rights of Jews. Uh, even more interesting was the fact that there was no large campaign uh, for Jewish emancipation. You can say, well, you know, that's the way things are done in Britain. Individual precedents are established, rights are expanded for communities, but that's actually not true. So it's interesting to contrast the Jewish uh, uh, emancipation process in Britain with that of other groups. So, for example, the Catholic Association agitated through large mass uh, protests with a lot of non-Catholic support for the passage of the Catholic Emancipation Act of 1829, which removed most of the political disabilities or constraints on Catholic participation in the political and public life of the country. The abolitionist movement, um, which was a massive cause of progressive opinion in Britain, uh, was respond and with heavy participation of the church and various religious groups, uh, resulted in the abolition of the slave trade in 1807 and of slavery itself in uh, 1833. The huge suffragette movement with very large scale uh, uh, support in uh, different sectors of, of uh, the social um, strata <coughs> resulted in the passage of women's, women's enfranchisement in 1918 uh, uh, for women over 30 and for women over 28 and no, it was 1918. Yeah, late. Yeah, indeed. And in 1928. Uh, and similarly, you have the Chartists uh, at the beginning of the 19th century uh, establishing um, uh, the foundations of the British Labour Movement and the Union Movement. Uh, they were established in 1838 and a century or more of struggle for collective bargaining and workers' rights. These were all mass social movements of progressive Britain that involved huge debates in the press, etc. Nothing of the sort happened with respect to Jewish rights. One could say it was a smaller community, but it was not that small. Uh, and these were issues that did engage intellectuals. There were some speeches by people like Macaulay in Parliament, George Babbage Macaulay, um, who delivered a very fine speech in 1833 on Jewish disabilities, but these people were very much the exceptions. Even more interesting was the fact that the Jewish community was by and large not uh, particularly in favor of a large campaign. They viewed the whole issue of the emancipation with a great deal of ambiguity. Uh, the, pre the, the precursor of the Board of Deputies, which is like the Jewish Federation, or the main elected representatives of the Jewish community, were uh, these groups uh, were extremely um, uneasy about public campaigning. They uh, generally relied upon um, what could be called Stadlanu politics, translated as sort of elitist politics, where representatives, wealthy representatives of the Jewish community, used their positions of influence with counterpart members in the economic and political elite of Britain uh, to secure dispensations for individual Jewish cases, which then established the precedent. That's the way it is. Let's go on now to um, more contemporary uh, instances of this kind of behavior. So. Um, <clears throat> Large-scale Jewish immigration to Britain started in 1880 from Eastern Europe, uh, when you had again, uh, in response to pogroms in Ukraine and Russia, well, the Ukraine, because Jews were not living in Russia at the time, they were in the Pale of Settlements, plus anti-Jewish activity by East European governments like Romania. Uh, you had a large-scale immigration to Britain, which is when the bulk of the Jewish community really uh, entered the country 
Uh, it moved in size from 65,000 in 1880 to 300,000 in 1914, to 200,000 concentrated in London. And that's more or less its demographics today, essentially. It peaked at 500,000 in the 50s, uh, but what you see today are exactly these numbers. Uh, the Jews who came in this period, as anticipated at the, uh, in the period of the uh, middle of the 18th century, were impoverished, largely impoverished East European Jews, who established their main centers in the east end of London, which was sort of like the Lower East Side. Uh, to, uh, in New York was to Jewish immigration in America. Um, very quickly on about uh, the, the um, presence of the large numbers of Jewish immigrants provoked an uh, enormous amount of hostility and opposition. Uh, much of it explicitly anti-Semitic, uh, some of it uh, coded in the form of um, um, anti-alien uh, xenophobia. Most of the immigrants coming at that time were Jewish. Uh, this resulted in the passage of a whole sequence of anti-alien restrictions from 1905 through the the First World War, which effectively cut off all Jewish immigration completely. Um, to give you a sense of the extent to which it was directed at Jews, let me um, quote from Balfour. Arthur Balfour, Prime Minister uh, of Britain, the same one who gave us the Balfour Declaration, which reached fruition in the partition of Palestine. Uh, today is the anniversary of that day. The same Balfour um, <coughs> Stated in a, the debate in 1905 over the first aliens restriction, which was an anti-immigrant bill, said the following: It would not be to the advantage of the civilization of the country that there should be an immense body of persons who, however patriotic, able, and industrious, however much they threw themselves into national life, still by their own action remained a people apart and not merely held a religion differing from the vast majority of their fellow countrymen, but only intermarried among themselves. So this is clearly a very targeted kind of attitude and. Balfour represented a large component of the opinion of the Conservative Party, um, and um, this was key policy. So, um, what you, there was also a um, uh, conservative um, politician who became Home Secretary in the 20s, whose name was William Johnson Hicks. Uh, his career was studied in a publication by David Cicerani, who's coming to talk to you next semester. Uh, who uh, made it his policy to enforce discriminatory uh, uh, immigration standards uh, and, um, with his home secretary, making sure that East European Jews were part. So by the time the 30s came around uh, and the crisis in uh, European Jewry emerged, first in Germany, then in Austria, then in Poland, and Czechoslovakia, and Poland, due to the rise of Nazism, there was no need to introduce um, anti-immigrant legislation to keep uh, Jews out. That legislation existed, and it was a part. Um, in fact, um, uh, it was not simply the conservative government uh, that supported it, the TUC, the uh, Trade Union Congress, uh, and most of the union movement actively supported, from 1905 on, uh, the exclusion of Jewish immigrants. They regarded them as an undesirable element, largely for reasons of economic competition. They didn't want cheap labor. There were parallel developments in America. However, immigration in America wasn't actually cut off until 24, and the uh, the results of the uh, motivation for that is a more generalized xenophobia, and here it's clearly targeted. Um, during the uh, 30s, in the period of uh, large-scale um, uh, uh, emergence of a large-scale refugee problem, first from German Jews, and then uh, successively Austrian, uh, Czech, and Polish Jews, uh, Britain um, uh, followed a policy of continuing to apply its existing um, um, immigration controls to uh, keep out as many Jews as they could, uh, the reason being uh, that they argued that the country couldn't support them economically. Now, in fact, those refugees who did enter were generally supported by the Jewish community. There was an official agreement between the Jewish community uh, and the British government for, for German Jews that the Jewish community would cover the costs of absorbing all of these uh, immigrants. That uh, agreement uh, lapsed. With the, uh, in 38, with the Anschluss, in which Austria was conquered uh, by the Nazis, the Jewish community said they no longer afford it. What you saw um, time and time again, um, reading, uh, um, what you saw time and time again uh, in the statements of government uh, ministers as well as uh, labor people from the TUC was a great deal of sympathy for the victims of Nazism. There was no, certainly no. Uh, lack of support and sympathy for Jews facing Nazi persecution, and an unwillingness to allow them uh, to enter Britain because of uh, um, a, a generalized sense that they were a community that couldn't be easily absorbed, and that should they be absorbed, uh, there would be a rise in anti-Semitism. This is a theme uh, 
that constantly comes up in statements by British uh, officials, particularly in the Home Office and in, uh, uh, in the Foreign Office, that, that should, uh, uh, should uh, immigration uh, go beyond certain levels, that there will certainly be anti something because Jews are simply not easily assimilable. Um, there's a great deal of detail here that's worth discussing, but I'm, I'm going to pass over it. What is worth saying is that Britain was in no way unique in its uh, response to uh, Jewish immigration and desperate plight of Jewish refugees in the period of the 30s and during the Second World War. Um, most Western democracies behaved in exactly the same way or worse. Canada's uh, history, in fact, uh, was notable for being perhaps the worst of all Western democracies. The United States was somewhat more generous, but continued to, uh, to uh, co-manage with Britain uh, a policy of um, deflecting the immigrant policy, making uh, the immigrant crisis by making statements, that, uh, making sure that uh, immigrants were not helped. However, we began to see a very major diversion between American and uh, British policy in 1944, with the establishment of the War Refugee Board um, under, um, uh, under uh, Morgenthau, um, was at the time Secretary of the Treasury, and uh, the beginning of American proactive um, proactive measures to try and help uh, uh, survivors uh, behind enemy lines, and the British opposing these actions on the grounds that they were interfering with uh, um, with uh, uh, the uh, economic uh, uh, boycott of these countries. The real the real uh, difference, however, emerges in the post-war period. So, in the post-war period, you see from forty-five to forty-eight progressive liberalization of American immigration under Truman uh, and the uh, admission of uh, large numbers of Jews from the DP camps in proportion to their numbers in those camps uh, were in, into the states, whereas in, in Britain what you see uh, is in fact a determination not to allow them in. And this was under a labor government with, uh, with Bevan as the foreign minister uh, declaring that in fact um, uh, the uh, Jewish problem, the refugee problem, had to be solved by repatriating European Jews, neither in Palestine nor in Britain, but they should be sent back to where they came from, which meant Poland and the Ukraine section. In Poland, there were post war, uh, there were post -war uh, pogroms going on, uh, which the British were very well aware of, and this did not affect uh, uh, their, their policies. And you see this very clearly. So, uh, in the post war period, Britain actually had a severe labor shortage. So, unlike the 30s, there was no labor. Uh, uh, Surplus due to depression was a labor shortage. And in this period, 365,000 non Jewish immigrants were allowed into the country, and 600,000 alien uh, work permits were issued uh, to recruit foreign workers, many from the same DP camps uh, that the Jews were in. But the Jews were explicitly barred from participating in those programs. Uh, in many cases, the uh, foreign workers who were brought in were not carefully screened, and not a small number of Nazi war criminals entered the country. By contrast, a program, a token program, was set into uh, set up to allow in uh, Jewish survivors on grounds of family reunification. The number was kept below 5,000. So it's not only that they were banned from uh, Palestine due to air pressure; they were also uh, uh, explicitly uh, not wanted uh, in in Britain. And every effort was made uh, to minimize the number who did get in. Uh, and um, uh, the statements are very clear now. How does this affect uh, the topics that I've been dealing with now? Well, the way it affects this is that what you see here is a consistent history where uh, the Jews were regarded as an alien element of Britain. So now these were attitudes uh, that were common, I think, to uh, Britain and the rest of Europe. Uh, but that, in fact, whereas in the rest of Europe, particularly in the post-Holocaust era, there's an acknowledgement of the catastrophe of Jewish life uh, in Britain, in Europe. In Britain, there's a systematic uh, misrepresentation of the nature of, of British uh, treatment of Jews throughout the history of Jewish presence in Britain. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, the Jewish community has, in no small measure, cooperated with this uh, as a means of sustaining its own position uh, in, 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 in an environment in which they enjoy uh, a highly uh, conditional acceptance. Um, one sees also, with itself include, an interesting uh, bridge between this kind of very traditional hostility towards Jews as a collectivity, not necessarily as individuals, and so-called progressive post-colonialist left-wing ideas uh, um, that are shaping much of the debate on the Israel-Palestine conflict. Palestine conflict. You see it uh, very clearly uh, in the work of um, the British historian um, Toynbee. So what Toynbee uh, tells us uh, is that um, Israeli colonialism is not a left-winger. Was that Israeli colonialism was perhaps the worst in the modern era 
uh, uh, on a par with America. Interestingly enough, Britain is not mentioned. Uh, Britain is considered exempt from this criticism. So uh, the Americans and, and the, uh, the Israelis are the worst uh, colonialists, but they, with Israel winning the competition because their colonialism is an anachronism, which extended into the modern world. On the other hand, what you see is uh, in the following statement, which really shows what's behind it. So what the objection to Israel as a country, uh, much criticized in, this country, in Israel and its, its policies, the present occupation of the uh, Palestinian territories, etc. But that's not really what was exercising um, 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 Toynbee, who was writing in the 60s and the 50s and 60s. What really exercised him was the idea of Jewish particularism, the existence of the Jews as a collectivity. He has this to say. This is a great spiritual treasure, talking about Jewish culture and the Jewish religious tradition. This is a great spiritual treasure which the Jews have to give to all peoples. But one cannot give a treasure and at the same time keep it to oneself. If the giving of this treasure is the Jews' mission, as it surely is, and this mission requires them now at last to make that their paramount aim in place of the incomparable aim that they've always put first so far, ever since their experience of the Babylon captivity. They'll have to give up the national form of the Jewish community's distinctive identity in order to become, without reservation, the missionaries of the universal church that will be open on an equal footing to anyone Jew or Gentile who gives his allegiance to Deutero, Isaiah's God, and seeks to do his will. And our time, the Zionist movement has been traveling in just the opposite direction to this. It has not only clung to and accentuated the national form of Jewish communal life, it has also put us back on a territory of basis. The Jewish religion is meant for all mankind, so far from its being unthinkable about the chosen people, it cannot fulfill its destiny of becoming a universal religion unless and until the Jews renounce the national form of their distinctive community identity for the sake of their universal religious mission. It's a fairly classic form of, of European Christian anti-Semitism, which sees the Jews as an anomaly and an illicit people, and ties it directly to um, Zionism in Israel. Now, you might say, well, what does this have to do with what's going on now? Well, the deliberate misrepresentation in the popular imagination of British attitudes towards Jews throughout history, I think, has played a major role in allowing people to say things which uh, uh, they might not otherwise have said. Uh, had they been um, perhaps constrained by uh, a, a, a conscious recognition of their own history. So um, recently, uh, in uh, the context of the boycott debate, the uh, uh, deputy secretary of the Transport General Workers Union, a man by the name of Barry Comey, uh, in June, stated that if he would not listen to objections to the union's boycott decision, uh, because, in fact, Britain had liberated and saved Jews uh, before and uh, during the, and after the Second World War. The statement is a mockery of the facts, but it's particularly ironic that he made the statement in his present position, given that his predecessor, who was, uh, uh, who was, who was the uh, Secretary General of his union, was none other than Bevin, who throughout the 30s campaigned to support government immigration policies, keeping Jewish refugees from uh, Europe. Uh, the Nazis out of Britain, and who after uh, the war as foreign secretary made sure that they could not get into Britain either. So it's this kind of deliberate blindness to a historical past rather than the attitudes themselves, which I think play a particular role in shaping public discourse in Britain. If one is convinced then, uh, that, that one has been extremely generous, liberal, forthcoming, progressive, and tolerant, uh, then of course one allows oneself um, all sorts of uh, freedom of uh, expression in uh, entertaining explicitly racist and uh, misguided notions, which perhaps uh, Europeans whose attitudes are not substantially different will not allow themselves, uh, given the kind of past uh, which has been explicitly acknowledged on the continent. something 
that you can feel. It's something that was almost, as you were saying last night, impolite to discuss. I think this, this analysis is even more extraordinarily important. So, so thank you. So, question. So, you know, let's assume that they came from Mars. And you convinced me that uh, the Brits are defending themselves against uh, some kind of uh, horrible threat for the Jews. Mm. I still don't understand what is the danger that the Jews are bringing to Britain. To, whom? The, to Britain. How uh, such, a, such a very important uh, a target to be in the focus of uh, this uh, treatment, to be scrutinized. Uh, in such a way through history, mm -hmm. can they be it's good? First of all, from your accent, it sounds like you don't come from Mars, but from where I come from, but that's another matter. Um, you are asking the question that I ask myself on a daily basis. Why are we, let's assume everything they say is right about the Middle East. And not all of it is wrong. This is, I, I didn't bring this up in the conversation now because I was not talking about the Middle East, but about Jews in Britain and how the Middle East is playing out in the context of that issue. Um, I am not a supporter of Israeli government policy. I've long been a critic, um, very much on the left of the Israeli political spectrum. I'm highly critical of Israeli government policy. This was a country like any other country. Uh, and what one is seeing, therefore, is, is not criticism of government policy, but a demonization uh, or trading in, in ethnic demonology, uh, which has little to do with the facts of the Middle East. Right? Um, Darfur is not a serious issue for the British press. Uh, in the same way that the Balkan Wars, although covered in the press, didn't generate outrage. Um, so why is it that there is this obsession with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict which then spills over into demonology? Yes, many legitimate criticisms of Israel are raised. And that's the problem with what's going on here, is it's hard to disentangle the legitimate criticisms, which are well taken and should be pursued with vigor, from the bizarre demonology that slips into so easily, conspiracy theory and the myth of Jewish power and Jewish malevolence and criminality, bringing us back to the image of the Jew of Malta and the merchant class, which seems to run through the culture uh, and the popular imagination uh, uh, continually and inform these discussions. Why is it? And I don't have a clear answer for that. Why should Britain or the rest of Europe be obsessed with the Middle East to the exclusion or near exclusion of most other issues, including Iraq, which is, of course, constantly brought up as a disaster? generally attributed to the United States, their own role in Iraq is seriously downplayed. Why is it that other kinds of disasters where the casualty figures are higher, where the human rights violations are higher, where more people are killed and suffering, not exercising these people in the same way? Well, I, because there's something, that's to me the indicator that something irrational is, is happening. That what's going on is really not a debate about the Middle East as such, but the use of the Middle East to leverage uh, an internal uh, um, uh, an internal discourse, which is being driven by factors that, that, that are coming from within traditional British historical uh, concerns. Uh, and in this sense, I mean, uh, the conclusions that I'm suggesting tentatively are that in fact we're seeing very traditional British attitudes played out in a new package that somehow um, what really bothers them about Israel is not so much what it does, which is in many cases highly objectionable, but more so than what Britain has done say in Northern Ireland, more so than Australia did, or more so than what, what other countries are doing. It seems to me what bothers them that Israel is to them a challenge precisely because it is the most radical affirmation and embodiment of Jewish collectivity, which is what they are not able to deal with. Jews are fine in, a, in, in what amounts to an Albini status if they are not visible, or if their visibility consists in a kind of diffident, um, decollectivized, denationalized form which can be treated as tractable. And this they, I think, share with the rest of Europe. The main difference is the rest of Europe went through the occupation of the Holocaust by and large. And there are constraints that are externally imposed on what people will say. And you see this even in France or in Spain. Uh, there are, the people will not say certain things. They will not engage in a boycott because they know what boycotts mean when, when Jews are on the scene. They will not engage in um, certain kinds of tropes. Because, uh, this is not to say that their attitudes are more um, uh, moderate, in many cases they're more extreme. The kind of real blood curdling anti-Semitism lives on in many places there. But these constraints operate because their history is increasingly not misrepresented 
Whereas in Britain it has. In Britain, I think there's a mythology about what British history concerning Jews has been and, and is today. And that this is what protects them from uh, um, dealing with uh, the attitudes that continue to inform these discussions and allows them to say things which otherwise they wouldn't say. As a, as a Jew who left uh, Germany in 41, late 41, and lived through all the periods in Christian time, I had the impression that when the Jews were down after November 38, uh, the only place where people who left the concentration camps who had to leave uh, was open was England, where the permits were issued. Uh, quite early, and also there were the kinder transports. Okay. So I'm wondering how that fits into your story. Is okay. there an the exception? There, there were, they did, Britain took a total of, of 80,000 Jews. They didn't walk all the trip. There were in, in, in extraordinary examples of generosity. But it, this was done within the framework of existing uh, restrictions on immigration. Officially, the policy was Jews could come in only to the extent that they could satisfy the requirements of immigration restrictions meant they had to show themselves not to be, uh, to be useful to the British economy and to be liable to, to British interests. Now, um, in fact, they, it's not the case that, that large numbers were taken. 70 to 80,000 were taken. Those were taken, almost all of them were, were granted um, temporary residence. The kinder transport was 9 to 10,000 kids. Uh, the interesting thing about the kinder transport, which was a very important, generous act of decency in a very dark time, 1938, 10,000 Jewish children were brought from, from Germany and Austria by train. The interesting thing to point out there is that their parents were not allowed in. Now, why were their parents not allowed in? Because of immigration restrictions on the British side. The Germans were desperate to get rid of them. So if they hear 10,000 kids were turned into orphans because of British restrictions, not because of German restrictions. They, they, the, 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 um, the, the permits that were issued were issued in very limited numbers. And they, there was a general hierarchy. Germans were preferred to Austrians. Austrians were preferred to Czechs and Czechs were preferred to Poles. There was a strong preference for political refugees of any kind, Jewish or non-Jew. There was a general uh, unwillingness to accept refugees who were called racial or economic refugees, which were included most of the Jews who were fleeing the Nazi, who couldn't show that they had been uh, persecuted for political reasons. Uh, and, and in fact, it's simply not the case that large numbers were taken down. Moreover, after the war, uh, uh, the uh, treatment of many of the refugees was really quite shameful. First of all, during the war, there was a constant effort to repatriate them, to get them out of Britain into other places. So 10,000 were actually re-emigrated out of Britain during the war. 10 to 20,000. So 60,000 remained after the war. And they were still on, 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 on temporary residence, unlike the states where they were immigrants. Okay, 250,000. Uh, they, were, they were on temporary residence. Many of the restrictions on their um, work activities, which were imposed by the states, were illegal. It was shown to be illegal, of course, but the, but the authorities made sure not to tell the, 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 the Jewish refugees until 46, 47. And this included people who fought in the army or people who had assisted the war effort in, in a variety of activities. The idea was that as many as possible should be able to force them out. When they were finally regularized, it was in 1948, three years after the end of the war, and very much. The idea was that we don't want to The more we have it, the more anti Semitism is going to be. This was not. This is not Nazi-style racism, but the idea is that Jews in large numbers ought not to come in. There were big fights with the Americans towards the end of the war, precisely over the issue of what to do with things like the, the uh, Horthy offer. Right? When, when Hungary, under Admiral Horthy, offered to let all the Jews, or many of the Jews, who had left in Budapest and in Hungary, go, those who had not been evacuated by the Nazis. Right? And then the, the, the Americans were pressing for immediate acceptance of the offer. Whether they would have taken them, there's another question. They may not have. This was the summer of 44. And the British were spent three weeks saying, yes, in principle we agree, but we're not going to, we're worried about being swamped by large numbers of refugees. And a similar situation happened in India. So there was this constant theme as we can't take too many. We can take a limited number, yes, and there were many instances of, of, of a kind of heroic generosity on the part of the individual officials. And there was a great deal of sympathy for Jews as, as, as being persecuted by Nazis. There was not a willingness to accept any large numbers. Okay. And this persisted long after the war. That is the point. It was after America that had essentially opened its doors. That's the difference. Not that Britain was somehow unique in keeping out refugees in Boston. And you're right. It was far more generous in Canada. More generous than the U.S. in 1939. No. Well, yes, you're right, because of the uh, St. Louis. Yeah, 39, that's true. I think that's, that's correct. 
Um, thank you very much. Uh, uh, um, a brilliant uh, description of what's going on in England. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, just a couple of things I wanted to ask how you would fit them into the picture. And one is, is, is something which rather puzzles me that phenomenon, albeit a, a, a limited one, of Holocaust Memorial Day. Why is this being taken on board by a British establishment? What is actually being stated when January 25th commemoration? Auschwitz Day is taken on board as a British, um, a, 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 a British public event. In practice, one notice, notices that not that much is done. What is done is done in schools um, and mainly masterminded by the Holocaust Education Trust, which is a bunch of well meaning people, many of them other activists and uh, uh, groups and so on. But still, it is there. And um, it's on the calendar. It also, of course, there have been problems with Islamic groups, and not even very extreme Islamic right. groups, who won't participate. But nonetheless, um, it sticks, and that interests me very much. And my, my other question was about the role of British Jews in feeding the, um, the, anti, the extreme anti Zionists sing, singling out of Israel process. And that has something to do with their consciousness as British, uh, 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 as being British, I think, and what that entails. I think it could be fitted into your narrative, but I wonder how you would, you would do um, that. Okay, let me ask you the first question of, about Holocaust Memorial Day. So, for those who don't know this, uh, Britain has an official Holocaust Memorial Day. It's January something or other? January, right. And that was established under Tony Blair, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Right, under the Tony Blair government. The official, uh, the Holocaust Education Trust, which you also refer to, is an organization which is not Jewish, by the way, which has done a lot of work promoting Holocaust education. There was at one time on the internet a claim that uh, the Holocaust was no longer taught because of objections people died among Muslim students. It's not true. The great deal of Holocaust education in British schools, it's, it's certainly the case. Holocaust education was, came in quite late in Britain compared to many other countries, but it, it has always remained basically controversial. And the reason it's controversial is not people don't want to acknowledge the Holocaust as such, but they object, many people object, particularly the Muslim groups that you refer to, to the idea that a particularistic recognition of the Jewish Holocaust should be, uh, should be uh, given national recognition to the exclusion of others. So, so which ones? Because in fact, Holocaust Memorial Day does in fact recognize others, the Armenians are mentioned, uh, etc. So they said, well, what about El Nakhba? So many Muslim groups say, what about El Nakhba, which is the uh, disaster of 48, as they describe it, in which Palestinian refugees, 800,000 of them, were expelled from, from their homes in Palestine. Uh, so there's a great deal of ambivalence about Holocaust, both amongst Jews and non Jews. Right? Um, most Jews are